Hey folks, I hope everybody's doing well. I'm going to actually uh, start another series, and this one I've, a uh, long time ago, went deep into a chart that is going to make this um, really doable. Not that any of the other series I've started are not doable, it's just, um, it seems to be my... Uh, uh, modus operandi that I'm able to push really hard and thoroughly uh, through one topic to a degree and then what I usually have to do is break from it go with another one pick back up so all the ones that <clears throat> I so far have out there that just aren't finished it's alright they're gonna get picked back up at some point in time finished put in a playlist so no worries now this one I had tried to start months ago and uh, the the initial video for it's probably still on my channel which if that's so after I'm done with this I'm probably going to erase it just because what you're going to get from this or what I'm going to be trying to accomplish in this is um, it's just better and it's more advanced than that was um, I realized after making that video that there was a lot of things that I had to go back over because I didn't really understand the scope of some things. And th that actually precipitated the article uh, I wrote and published at the Obery Project site and then turned into an audio and visual presentation called The Patriarchs, Their Livestock, The Land. All worthwhile, because it gave me a better grasp on what I should be doing on this particular project. Uh, this I'm going to be titling The Exodus Under a Microscope, because I'm going to be looking at the Exodus in ways that I personally have not seen nor read somebody look at it in. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to see is this emergence of a landscape, a geography, and a climate that can't come close to matching. The Middle East, Palestine, Egypt, Sinai, the Upper Arabian Peninsula, Jordan, I mean, honestly, in all the reading I do and all of the details, I spend countless hours refining, trying to understand, understanding uh, really the only portion of Palestine besides the idea that the Yerdan, because that bifurcating... Uh, river is called Yerdan. They call it the Jordan in the Bible, English translations. The only thing that even comes close is this idea that it would seem that it goes from a body of water because it's called Yum, um, going from, um, from that body of, of water, supposed body of water, down to another one that's called Yam Male, or it actually has uh, another name, Yam or Bay. And there's a interesting, I think, an interesting deeper mystery to that. Um, the supposed body of water that it would start at, and I don't know that that's its start, <clears throat> it is a bit ambiguous, is Kunrath, K N R Th. And I don't say T, I say Th, because there's some somewhat double sounds. There's like the singular T sound in Obery, uh, which is represented by the so-called Tet. And I always have to say so-called because all of this sprang from rabbis. That's why I do not study in Hebrew. I don't read Hebrew. I study Obery. And that is the investigation of the language that existed before these rabbis came along <clears throat> and muddled it up with all of their nikud, their 
illogical pronunciations and their ridiculous lexicons and concordances that have sprang from it. And then when you put English on top of that, it gets worse. And you put, if you put Greek on top of a Masoretic understanding of Obri, thus turning it into Hebrew, which I do not recognize, I will never ever say Hebrew unless I'm pointing out the error in that language. It's Obri. If you put Greek on top of that, it gets even more diluted. And if you get a group of people together who have an agenda or are extraordinarily confused, then you end up with many of our modern English translations. And from what I've heard, talking to people who have English as a second language or speak other languages and have read the Bible in various other languages, um, the translations from Hebrew into that language are just as bad. So, I'm going to just pretty much start from scratch. And I have five main objectives. Um, one is to determine relative locations of proper places and geographical specifics based on their description and proximity to other places and particulars findable within Obery scriptures. Some Arame called Aramaic scripture will be considered when necessary, but a systematic breakdown of roots and related words currently cannot be applied to Arame or Aramaic text in the same way as the Obery text. So, translation of what I just said, I'm going to be doing my best to give you an idea of how relevant locations are to one another because these details do exist in scripture but not all at once and you often have to spend a great deal of time looking at the details of either many different places or things or people related to certain places to get a good idea of what's going on here. Now, I don't think that's an accident. I think that's actually quite deliberate. It has a great deal to do with how we would forget and um, how the man of sin, the lawless one, would fool the world. And it has a great deal to do with how we are now going to rediscover our land, our heritage, our inheritance, um, our genealogy. So these aren't mistakes. The fact that these things are, are hidden within Scripture and that the Father, Yahweh, is allowing these things to be discovered bit by bit by various peoples. Um, absolutely deliberate. So the second objective, I want to ascertain descriptions of locations through all possible means and compare this to Palestine, Egypt, and surrounding areas. So that's going to be part is getting as much out of the description of each place, which will have a lot to do with going into the words um, and what the words, the characters that make up the words mean. What are their roots? What, what are we being told in the name itself? So the third objective, perform basic sketches as we go with the intent of forming a basic working model of a map. And I have a real, um, if it'll open, 
doesn't want to open. Now it does. Now it doesn't. <laughs> Give it a second here. I may have to pause this and get it to work. It's just a basic, it's a, a Microsoft product. It's just, I think it's just called Draw 3D, but I've got it in there. And now, all right, I'm going to pause this and make it work. Okay, so after right clicking and commanding close about a thousand times, Microsoft's 3D Paint, like every other one of their products, and Google's and Apple's and all of the other monopolies out there, it has chosen to stay where the heck it wants to stay. So anyways, objective four, to word study all locations. Now that is linked to one of the earlier objectives, but to further clarify, as locations often receive their Obri names based on characteristics, and these characteristics will enable us to get a far better idea of the type of place being named. This does happen a lot. In fact, you'll see in your English translations, you might see a lot of locations, geographical specifics, or proper place names. That might end in, in English, maybe like a, an O-N, like uh, Hebron, okay? However, if you look at it in Obri, it's actually H-B-R-U-N, or U-N, Habarun. Now that U-N is, it is a suffix that always denotes, um, the earlier root having <clears throat> this this place having the characteristic of the earlier root so think of uh, from like Judges 15 uh, the strongest man ever noted in the Bible right uh, in English for some reason they call him Samson which is a horrific transliteration of his name his name is actually Shemashun and it's the sh, m, sh, u, n, shemashun. Now, the word for the sun in the sky is shemash. So you put that un at the end, and his name is basically like characterized by the sun, shemashun. It'd be like the English equivalent of sunny. So, habarun that HBR, if we determine that three-character root, or if it's a two-character root with an additional character for modification, we can understand far more about that place from its name, since many places were named after their characteristics. Okay, now last objective, because I had to pause it. Last objective is number five, to use common sense when considering these places and conditions instead of mindlessly applying the model we've all been programmed to receive just like the eagle said so what that means it's very similar to the first objective we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have to consider um the beyond ridiculous um, various journey charts of whether they be part of the problem or whether they just be sincere people who were convinced that this had to happen in Palestine and the Middle East just because somebody said so. Well, we're probably going to compare that area. <laughs> And, and where they say that, that these things had to happen. So you get a visual image. But uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is um, now instead of uh, Microsoft's 3D Paint, which is a monster, um, I'm going to use Serif Draw Plus, which their programs are really, really cool. Um, 
kind of based on uh, Adobe programs like Illustrator. And they have one that's kind of like Photoshop. I think they even have one that's kind of like Premiere, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And as we can, if we understand where a location should be, in, you know, in relation to another location, then some sketchings will be done. And um, if I can get uh, some sketchings uh, to a certain degree, what I'll do is I'll just save that. And when I pick up uh, the next episode of this, uh, I'll just open that up and we'll work from there. I'm not, even though everybody who's been listening to my former videos, they know that besides the fact that I'm convinced that this didn't happen in Palestine, Egypt, or the Middle East, that I still think the most likely candidate for its location is North America. And I have lots of reasons that go way beyond just the two presentations that I've published or papers that I've published. But uh, for now, anyways, I'm, I'm not going to open up um, a map of North America and superimpose because even though I think that that is the most likely location for a myriad of reasons that I have not divulged yet, um, I'm not married to it, okay? So it's possible that, you know, could be somewhere else. And if so, what I want to do is try to look at what descriptions we can uh, derive from Scripture, okay? Um, and if people are going to just spend, you know, the comment section saying that it's here, it's here, it's here, and you're not going to go through the kind of uh, deep work to, to sort of prove that yourself, I may just become exhausted with that and ignore it. So you know, think before you comment. <clears throat> I spent years um, pretty much being one of those douchebags in the comment section that just really didn't think that a lot of creators, um, I guess all COINTEL Pro people aside, which, you know, they're being paid for their time, um, but creators who really are are laboring because of a, a passion for what's right and what's true, it takes a lot of work to put out things, you know, to prepare for them, to study for them. And then when, you know, somebody comes by and they just want to go down to the comment section and drop their pants and, you know, take a big dump all over uh, a lot of hard work, which I've done many, many times in the past. Um, and I'm trying to get better with, because the more I put time into what I'm doing, uh, the more I appreciate how much time other sincere, genuine, non co -intel pro people put into what they do. So, that being said, all right, this right here is the original chart that I came up with. Now, the, the first section of this chart on Romsis um, is a little bit more extensive than what you're going to see on the subsequent sections. The reason for that is because I actually had thought, after I had tried to make an initial presentation on this, that what I would do is actually write out uh, all of these various word studies in each one of these uh, <laughs> chart cells. And the thing is, if I were to do that, it would be a lot like um, other charts that I have, which I really do have to write that stuff in. Um, and what happens is, like on my nations and peoples chart that I'm still working on, um, it's huge. The document is huge. And I'm finding myself having to put many appendices in many. Um, and for something like this, it seems like if I lean more towards uh, an extemporaneous form, uh, it'll probably be better. So here's what we've got. When Yisrael exits 
Mitzrim. They have been staying in since they came into Mitzrim. And you've got to figure they were there for, we've got somewhere about 200 to 215 years. They were not they were not 400 years, and it wasn't Egypt. They are about 200, 215 years in Mitzram. They were 400 years in a land that was not their own, that they were strangers in, because that was between uh, the various areas of Canon and Mitzram. Okay, that equaled about 430 years. They were about 200 plus years in Mitzram. So when they exit Mitzram, they're exiting from the same place or area they had stayed for a very long time, which is Gashan or Romsis. They they're used interchangeably. Okay, so they are they are synonyms. And what I'm going to do is I want to figure out something about these places where they were at. Um. Because what it's going to do is it's going to tell us a lot about the type of landscape where they were at. And I figure when they came into Mitzram, it was during uh, one of the famines. Interestingly enough, because we're going to word study this a little bit, a famine is called a robe, R O B. The word for well, the word that's translated evil. And I got to tell you, the more I study Obri, the more I am um, beginning to appreciate a deep seated hatred for abstract words. Because abstract words, by their very definition and use, are not concrete. In order to understand abstract words and abstract language, you first need to have a strong, you have to have a strong understanding and conception of concrete words and language. So when they're using all of these abstractions like evil, mercy, faith. They do this in the New Testament too. They'll oftentimes turn verbs, actions, into <laughs> abstracts. <laughs> it's insane. So we want to try to be as concrete as possible in our understanding of these words, whether this word be an action or an object. And I'm going to try to use action and object far more than I'm going to be trying to use noun and verb. Um, I know in English that one of the most basic, um, and it's not just English, many languages, there, there's just a basic format to it. You know, you can have object, verb, but the most basic is usually object, verb, subject. However, you can just have object, verb, you can have um, object, connecting verb, adjective. Um, it's just what you need for a thought. And as I spend more time in language, the one thing that I'm trying to do is really get past um, all the preconceived notions that we have about language. I mean, any one of us we all learn the English language before we go to school and have teachers who have been given their curriculum by people like the Rockefellers and Carnegies. We learn English just from the experience of interacting with our parents and peers, um, maybe from watching television or reading little books. Anything like that, we learn it experientially. And so we understand innately that language is simply meant to direct thought or attention. And it's great how it's done because we can use a certain, I would assert, a finite amount of sounds that we can make 
with our mouths. We use those in ways that become very familiar. Those familiar sounds are put in context by the mind, and once contextualized, um, images form. These can be static images, or they can be uh, action images. It's pretty phenomenal. Language is, uh, is such an amazing tool. The thing is, even more amazing tools have taken uh, what is, in a sense, quite simple in its intent and have filled it up with so many various definitions, meanings, rules. It, it, it really has stomped uh, on language. And, it, and I would assert that the, the Masoretic as a, uh, a, a code language over Obery is one of the greatest crimes done to a language. Maybe it could be right up there with, with what has been done to English um, and the insidiousness of the way English has been changed and been used as a, as a real tool of uh, our own demise. Anyways, get on here. So we've got this place that they're staying. It's either Romsis or Gashan, and I'm going to spend a few minutes in uh, those two words. All right, so let's just start out with Romsis. Yes, <laughs> most English translations, they translate it Ramesis. Um, there's, there's a reason why these, these translations and transliterations are so bad. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you something, you know, I have been inviting some people to review specifically my articles or audio versions, audio video versions of the articles, the two articles I've written, The Patriarch, Their Livestock, and The Land, and The Land of Amory. Um, because first off, you know, and I've told them, hey, you know what, if you go ahead and, and criticize this to the nth degree, if you can, biblically. I really don't want to hear criticism as in, well, there's all of this extra biblical material that points to this, that, and the other. I, I understand that. In fact, I'm really familiar with the extra biblical material. I'm really familiar with all of the purported archaeological discoveries in various places in the Middle East. Trust me, I was very familiar with these things before I even started with this. So I'm not a babe in the woods here. The, the thing is, um, some of those that I've invited to take a look at this, um, the ones that I've invited, they are people that I think spend a whole lot of time studying the Bible. And I see them coming to some conclusions that uh, I've seen myself coming to in the past. Um, not that I in any way fancy myself as uh, far beyond these people. It's just <clears throat> we're all journeying. If we're filled with the the spirit of the the living Alaim, and I don't like to say God, and I'll tell you why. If you look up GD in the concordance, its main usage is of a deity. It is a Babylonian deity. If you put the obligatory vowel sound between G and D, you'd have God. And I really don't feel like calling Yahweh, you know, al Oleim, which would be uh, Aleim Almighty, and I don't want to use the G word. You'll see that the two are not the same. So I don't really like that. But anyways, rabbit trailing. <clears throat> what I want to say is I do respect a lot of people that are still KJV only people. I do. Because for a long time I was KJV only. And for much the same reasons. And those 
those reasons, they're, they're strong reasons because at their core is the preservation of, you know, a unified singular truth. And some, including myself, when I was KJV only, will go even past that to say we're looking at something that was inspired, like a translation that was inspired. Um, there's going to be a lot of reasons I can show why that's... I don't think we should take that point of view. Um, if something is inspired and it's perfect, there shouldn't be, for one thing, spelling errors or um, contradictions in spelling of the same person or place or specific uh, object or action. <clears throat> And we can see that with this location, Romsis, which is translated as Ramesses, within just the first two occurrences, we have a difference in spelling. In the first occurrence, the spelling in the translation is R-A-M-E-S-E-S. -E -E in the second, it's R-A-A-M-S-E-S. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a problem. So we've got to stick with the Obery and what I can, at this point in time, determine as being the best pronunciations, which would be Romsis. Now, <clears throat> Romsis, you could say, and I'm going to write it on the screen here real fast, because we do want to take kind of a, a look at it and maybe dissect it a little bit. I'm going to take down the width of my marker a little bit, and we'll just put this up. Now, most of these Obery characters, of course, are going to be very much like English. They don't have uppercase and lowercase. They just have one case. And I really ought to get a stylus. It would, it would help. <laughs> so I'm doing this all with a mouse. Okay. So that's pretty much how it would look <coughs> handwritten. And we can see the R, O, M. And then these two characters here would be reminiscent of S. And it, if you see this character in various forms by what they would call close languages to Obery, um, you'll see a similarity between this and S. The character that they most often use for S is the so-called Shin, which in today's Hebrew, they make it like that. And depending on where they feel like putting the dot either over to the left or over to the right. They'll say it's either sh or s sound, okay? This is actually a s or s sound here and not that. I don't accept any of those Masoretic rules. So what I would see as a mistake is looking at this Romsus as a straightforward compound in the sense of thinking of it like this. Well, Maybe we've got a root here up front and a root here in the back, like the first one being Rome and the second one being Masas. Well, the reason for that is because if we looked up Rho, uh, Strong's H7451 through 55, it all has connotations and specific denotations as... Uh, negative or evil, but again, there's that abstraction, which I just can't stand. And Masas, MSS, H4549, is translated to melt, faint, or liquefy, and actually just Mas, MS4522, would be forced labor, or tribute, or toil. And we can actually find that in the same verses that we might find Romsis. The reason I don't like just putting these two together as two roots, like say you could say Ro would be uh, evil or negative, and then Masas, melt, faint, or liquefy. 
somehow giving Rome Sis a, a very negative connotation then. Because, of course, that's one of the uh, storage cities that uh, Yishra was forced to build by one of the last Paroas before Yahweh delivers them and they leave. The problem with that is it's not a bad place in the first place, okay? Um, so, in context with uh, Genesis 47.11, where we first see Romsis, we can see from the first verse it's used in 47.11, it says, And Yusup placed his father and his brethren, gave them a possession in the Eretz, or land of Mitzrim, Eretz Mitzrim, in the best of the land, the land of Romsis, as Paroa had commanded. Earlier in that chapter, we see uh, Paroa talking to Yusap, which is translated Joseph. They said, moreover, unto Pero, for to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture, for their flocks, for the famine, or robe, R-O-B, is sore in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Gashan. Now, Gashan was an early land that they came to in the sense that when they had to travel between where they were staying and where Yusep was, which was at the current time the uh, capital or seat of Mitzrim, at least where he was staying, uh, and you would think Paroa was there uh, because of how easily they were having communications between Yusup and Paroa. Um, like, for instance, um, Genesis 46.29. So this is earlier than the chapter we were in. And this is in reference to Gashan. It says, And Yusup made ready his chariot and went up to meet Yishral, his father, to Gashan and presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck. So they started out, and they came to Gashan. And furthermore, Paroa tells them to stay in Gashan, and Gashan is Romsis. They are synonyms. And we'll see, uh, we'll see Gashan again um, in Genesis 47, 6. The land of Mitzrim is before thee, the best of the land. Make thy father and thy brethren to dwell. In the land of Gashan let them dwell. And if you know any of those men of activity among them, make them rulers over my cattle. And of course, just down below in 47.11, says, And Yusuf placed his father and his brethren, and gave them a possession in the land of Mitzrim, in the best of the land, Aretz, in Aretz Romsis as Perot had commanded. What a Perot command! Perot commanded that they stay in Gashan. So, Yosep put them in Romsis, as Perot had commanded. Okay, so, they are synonyms. So, the problem I do have is, first off, it would have an evil connotation if we just saw Ro as one root and Masas as another root. However, if you look at Obri as a language which consists of characters, and these characters um, essentially are bearing uh, their own certain amount of meaning in and of themselves, and you can see this very clearly when you start tracking roots throughout scriptures, and I'm talking about from Genesis uh, through Malachi, you'll see, um, you'll see basic roots that are changed in various ways, wherein they might only have a single occurrence, um, spelled in a slightly different way, because a character was added onto that same root, and it has the same sort of usage and provides the same sort of context, just with a different character, which gives it a slightly different feel or meaning to it. So, you can use these characters 
uh, in a singular way to provide emphasis or accent. The other thing is when multiple roots are put together, it is it is nearly a standard thing for certain emphasizing characters to be dropped. Now, take Rho, the first part of this root. If you put a, an E or E at the end of Rho, I'm going to write it here just below it. So let's put in RO with that E. And you can see the E to that character right there. Sometimes in, in block letters, you'll see it more like as I'm writing it to the upper right. Now, some people say, you know, it would be like that. I don't see it like that as often, but sometimes I do. In fact, I have seen it on the, um, it's either, uh, it is either the, um, the stone, the Decalogue stone in uh, New Mexico, which all of the characters on that stone are very close to the obri I use, or I saw it on the, it's like a, it looks like a mini sarcophagus that was found uh, Newark, Ohio. If you punch in Newark, Newark, Ohio, and you'll have to use Hebrew, you'll see it. Las Lunas is the stone in New Mexico. And it's very interesting. If more people would talk about the landscape where in the Las Lunas stone was found, uh, you'll start to see a <laughs> very interesting uh, patterns emerging. But uh, I can talk about that more later. So you can definitely see the E in, in this here. And sometimes you might see this, a character in which it looks like there's sort of a an arrow with an E sitting on its side like that, okay? But I've often seen it in the way that I'm currently using it when I write it by hand. When I write it by hand, it's just easier to write it out like you see there. It's still the E. So let's look at Roe. Roe 7462 ROE <clears throat> is called a verb by Strong's and it means to pasture, to graze animals. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, them calling something a verb or a noun or an adjective, as far as I'm concerned, is just as fiat as a lot of other things about Hebrew. But anyways, yes, it does have a lot to do with grazing or pasturing. In fact, you'll also see herdman or, you know, to herd, herding, um, as you scroll through it, and those are the translations. Go and feed them. She kept them. I will again feed thy flock. Keep thy flock. You see, it's got that, uh, it's got that denotation to it. The next couple of instances of Roa, as according to Strong, 74, 63, and 64, <clears throat> can be used as companions or friends, which is pretty strange when you look at like just straight row and it being used as <laughs> evil or not good. There's some serious problems with this language to be worked out. But anyways, so roe we can see as a verb to pasture. Now I did mention that mas or masas can be either forced labor or tribute or in the sense of masas like uh, to melt, uh, like you would think under exhaustion. In fact, it's used in context with that. But forget about that for a second. And Let's just imagine that we've got our RO and our M is in there as a plural, which it quite often is. In fact, ROM 7481 or 82 is most often translated as thunder or a great noise. Um, ROME, which should be 7483, is what they'll call a feminine version of that. I don't like the whole masculine feminine thing. I think direct and indirect is actually more appropriate. So, you know, you could apply something that's more thunderous. The interesting thing about thunder or sound, and we're going from obri to English, not every single word is going to have the perfect capture to it. Now, something interesting about the SS <clears throat> at the end is that 
just the word sus, as in SS, is used, and it's 5580. The thing is, it, it's got one occurrence, and in that occurrence, it's translated as worm or moth. Typically, in verses like that, that get the translation way off, oftentimes has modifiers in that verse before or after the word that seems to be way off and those modifiers are oftentimes very questionable as well however the word sus which would be sus which is 5483 it occurs 180 times and it's translated as horse and I think that that word is either correct or very near because of the contexts that it's often in. Um, so, as I wrote in my notes, you know, the sus can be horses or very near beasts of like kind. Um, and they dwelt there uh, because they were shepherds of various animals. Um, Yusep said the Roa, 7462, herdsmen are detested by the Mitzri. So uh, the Roa with the M for plurality, and I'm going on a bit of a limb here, to say that the Sus was either initially a designated horse land for Peroa, or the Sus illustrates the vastness of the land and how the herds roamed around it. When you see the sus used specifically at the end of a word, you could take something like uh, Yahweh Nisi, my banner, the banner being the N and the S, Nis, or you think of something like Sup as the edge of the C, S, that S, like the way that it looks even today in English, um, at least connotating a rolling, flowing of sorts. So, I guess what I would say I imagine, and not sh simply out of my own imagination, but what I'm seeing in this word is a large area of probably rolling land used mo mostly for herding large uh, herds <laughs> or pasturing large herds because of all it has to do with the various roots and I'm going to once again state that it doesn't seem that it could in any way have the negative connotation to it lest the author of Genesis was looking back and was calling the city of Romsis which was built which I don't know that the Mitzrim would have called it such an evil thing. Um, I think it would have been the Obri or the uh, Yisraeli would have called it something so evil. It just doesn't seem to have quite the likelihood to it that it was a good large land for shepherding. And that sus either means of herds or packs of uh, ruminant animals, or it denotes uh, the great rolling lands. Interestingly enough, with ROM being used as thunder, <laughs> this is what's amazing. Um, <clears throat> for anybody who's been out in, in a pasture land of any kind and has had anywhere near them even a small herd of, I don't care if it's horses or cows or pretty much any kind of relatively good-sized herding animal, uh, start moving within their proximity. And I mean really start moving. If they're really running one way or the other or something, it is amazing the sort of rumble in the ground that you feel. Um, eh. I, I've had, I mean, I've had single animals that were not that large um, be running or jumping near me 
and feel the ground move, much less talk about the sound that's generated in the plate of the ground that seems to act just like a, a vibratory plate. You got to think of that thunder, that sound of thunder of great herds. I can't begin to imagine the sound of thunder that the great herds of buffalo made uh, on this earth when they roamed in the size that it is said they roamed in. So Rome says is a good place and it would seem to be a very good big vast land. The, um, the, f the five occurrences of it um, really just go from that first one in Genesis 47 11 where it says it, they were given the best of the land the land of Romsus as Peroa commanded then the next occurrence picks up in Exodus 1 11 where we're bringing us up to speed and getting us in a a present uh, tense setting for Masha to be born and for us to witness his life and then for him to later lead Yisrael out of Mitzrayim at about 80. Um, and it says in Exodus 1.11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Peroa treasure cities or storage cities, which would have been Pithom, which would be a P-th-m, Pithom, and Romsis. And then next occurrence, and the children of Yisrael journeyed from Romsis to Sukkoth. Now that's where we're going to pick up. Um, and Numbers, actually, uh, in Numbers 33, it just goes back over all of the, uh, the places that they had went. So they departed from Romsis in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. All important information. Again, Numbers 33 and verse 5, and the children of Yisrael, or Bani, Bani Yisrael, removed from Romsis and pitched in Sukkoth. So that's the first thing we've got is Romsis to Sukkoth. And we're also going to look at Gashan and where it might be in proximity to other things. So Genesis 45.10 says, They shall dwell in the land of Gashan, and shall be near unto me. This land of Gashan was actually quite close to this major city that Yasap or Joseph was dwelling in, which I think was also near to where the place that Perot was. Um, Peroah. And he sent Judah before him unto Yasap to direct his face unto Gashan. And they came to the land of Gashan. Many... Uh, occurrences of Gashan in Genesis uh, in the 40s and in the 50s, a whole lot of them. But that's not actually what's going to give us a good idea of location. Um, it definitely tells us this, that this was a really nice land. In fact, <clears throat> it was, uh, as far as the boundaries of Mitzrim at the time, some of the best land there was. And one thing that made so much sense for them to live in Gashan, because as Yusup said to his brothers, and you'll find it in Genesis 46-34, and this is where he's kind of plotting with them, telling them what, they, well not plotting, but he's directing them what they should say to Peroah when he presented them. He says, that you shall say thy servants trade hath been about cattle uh, from our youth even until now both we and also our fathers that ye may dwell he's telling them, you say this so that you may dwell in the land of Gashan for every shepherd Ruah, is an abomination unto the Mitzri they didn't like shepherds thought shepherds were filthy so they stayed in this separate land worked out really good too because when all those plagues came the plagues hit all the inhabited parts of Mitzrim but it left Gashan alone so when we get up a little bit further with Gashan we're gonna see a couple of things that are of great importance first I'm gonna tell you real fast what uh, <clears throat> Strong says about Goshen uh, they'll say a region in northern Egypt east of the Lower Nile, where the children of Israel lived from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses, which certainly wasn't 400 years. Anyways, so 
when we get further on in our appearances of Gushan, G, Sh, N, Gushan. Um, we get into Joshua. Here we go. Now, Joshua 10.41 says, and Joshua, it's actually Yusho, same name as our Mashiach, Yusho. He smote them from Kadesh Barno, even, unto Oza, not Gaza, Oza, and all the country of Gashan, even unto Gabun. Hmm, really? Well, how do we do that? I'll tell you how Strong's and uh, the rabbis do it. They'll tell you that it's a district in Palestine between Gaza and Gibeon. In addition to the first definition I read you, it's not the same place. They're saying it's a different place. And then definition C, a town in the mountains of Judah, probably in the district of, of Goshen. <laughs> so in the district of the second one, I guess. Although the text actually gives us no reason at all to think that they are separate places. Okay. Now, first thing, we do know for a fact that the uh, inheritance of Judah, translated Judah, is actually borders on Mitzram. And there's a few verses that tell us that. Now, one of the most telling passages is from Joshua 15.4, and the preceding verses are describing the border of the inheritance of Judah. And it says that it passed towards Otzmun, and there's that un. <laughs> so if we look into Otzm, so what's Otz? Otz is a tree. Otzm, trees. Probably forest. If it was an Otzmun, it could probably mean a forested area. Doesn't sound like anything. <laughs> Let's look at being mapped. Doesn't sound like anything that's down here, does it? To you? Not to me either. Anyways, from Ots Otsmun, and went out unto the Nahal, or river, of Mitzrim. And the goings out of that coast were at the Yum, which they say the sea. It really stinks that Yum is sea and Yum is west. <laughs> <laughs> this shall be your south coast. Okay, but this river, uh, this Nahal of Mitzrim, is a bifurcation. We'll see rivers and nares, which seem so far to me like two different kinds of rivers as we know rivers to be. Um, they're used as borders, naturally. I mean, you know, it. I think a child could look at an overhead map and tell you, oh yeah, I mean, I completely see why uh, Indiana and Ohio and Illinois are detached from Kentucky, or how it is that Illinois is separated from Iowa and Missouri by rivers, by major rivers, you know, and, and parts of areas of many states are divided by rivers. The reason that most western states are these big squares is a, just a great idea of Thomas Jefferson's, I guess. But um, typically, that's just a, a real common sense thing that borders are often defined by a river. And we know what river that is, or uh, Nahal that that is. It is the Shihur. Um, and on one side of the Shihur, you have um, the Palshathi city of Oza, and Oza has a number of suburbs and boroughs, and then you have four other major Palshathi, translated Philistines, Palshathi cities uh, with suburbs and really a lot to them. These were some major places. So they're on the one side of this Shihur, but since their land was allotted to Judah, and you'll see that at first 
They take it, it's taken back, they take it again. This goes back and forth quite a lot over hundreds of years. That from this area, Otsmun, unto the Yam, so I guess we're going to have to assume that it's C for now, which, you know, most rivers dump into a C, so that's safe to figure it's C instead of West. That's, uh, it's giving us a border. The thing is, it also says here in Joshua 15, if I refer back, yeah, it says right there, in Occurrences of Glishans, 1551, um, and Gashan, and Halun, and Gale, 11 cities with their villages. Now, is it crazy that there would be a city of Gashan in the area of Gashan? Well, I don't think it's crazy. Um, referring back to Joshua 10.41, he smote these people from Gashan even to Gabun. And then Joshua 11.16, So Yusho took all the land, the hills, and all the south country, and all the Eretz Gashan. So it's the same way of stating it as back here in Genesis when they're in Mitzrim, Eretz Gashan. So what am I getting at? Well, what I'm getting at is this. If I'd open up the right program, okay, so let me select some of this, get rid of it. What I'm saying is this. So let's figure a river. That's going to start in one place. Now, we don't know what direction in which it flows. Now, the people who think this happened in, in the Middle East, they would have to tell you that it, it's going to have to flow out towards the west because it's going to have to dump into the Mediterranean. Or they could say it flows southward, but they're going to have a problem with that in the sense that they would have to say, well, it's got to be a river flowing all the way down into the eastward gulf, the Gulf of Aquaba or Aqaba um, of the Red Sea. And they would have to say that somehow the, the land of Gashan would have to be somewhere in that area instead of way over where they try to say that it's in the southern portion of the Nile, somewhere around here. And they've moved it. They've, they've tried to say that there, there once was a defunct branch of the Nile, and they think it was there, and uh, just, ah, uh, they, they keep coming up with all kinds of crazy nonsense. Well, here's one of the things. They also try to say that where they say the Gaza Strip is today, that that's where basically the cities of the Palsha theme were, and that this was a small area. Of course, they're forgetting about Gerar. They try to call it a city in their concordances, but it's actually not. It's a really, really big place. And I touch on that in my article and video, The Patriarchs, Their Livestock, and the Land. The since Oza was right near this river, and it is the Shehur, they would have to put it in here, going out to the Mediterranean Sea. There's no way around it. And then they're going to have to <clears throat> look somewhere where that river stops and figure that land of Gashan somewhere down in here. Or what? Over in here. Now, the thing is, anybody who knows anything about this area knows that this area is absolute bleak desert and nothing but. Of course, you'll hear things like, you know, desertification. <laughs> and uh, there's really no proof of that whatsoever. But here's the thing. So uh, that a river could have started at any given point, And I'll see if I can fit this on here. Let's just say... Here's the point where it started. I'll pull a little, little dot there, okay? Now, it could have went depending on what sea, because it doesn't name the sea exactly, does it? Now, it says that there is a sea of the Palsha theme. It also says that there is a great sea, Yam Gadul. It never says the two are the same. 
and there are just a myriad of descriptions of the boundaries of the promised land um, that really draw an interesting picture and you have to actually gather all of those up and start to look at them uh, but anyways so let's say even that there was a river that made its way eastward and that there was a sea over here because it doesn't tell us which direction in the Bible it does not tell us which direction eastward or westward Mitzrim is we can see oftentimes in a, or a, a dissension verse and an ascension verse uh, concerning like Abraham descended into Mitzrim and ascended uh, back up into Canaan. But that oftentimes has to do with elevation. Not like we would look at a map and think of north up here and south down here and we could think of um, descending as going to the south and ascending as going to the north. So it's a little bit of a uh, a head scratcher. We do know that Negab uh, is used for a southward direction. At least that's what it's always translated. So let's stick with that for now. But we don't know, and it's never said, that Mitzram is, let's just say, southwest over this way. Never says that. Doesn't say it's southeast either. What if Mitzram is actually entirely southward of Canaan? or the land of promise. And we have this river starting at a point, and it goes off into a sea, and we have <clears throat> the uh, we have the land of the uh, the Palshathim all along here. I was gonna say it's a big, big land. I probably didn't even make it as big as it the descriptions that I've seen of it are. And it follows along uh, this particular sea for quite some ways. Could be over here too, and the, the river could go this way. It's very possible. But at some point, what I'm seeing is that the border of Mitzrim might be a very long, very wide border. Because we, we also have an, an area, a land called Shur. And Shur borders Mitzrim, this land of Shur, okay? So somewhere in here, between the border of the land of Shur, and maybe I made that too close, I probably should have started out smaller. Let's just say the border of Mitzrim is really big, really wide. And maybe Gashan, somewhere in here, because as according to Joshua 11:6, so Yusho took all that land, the hills and all the south country, and all the Eretz Gashan. Now it says, and the valley and the plain. And I'm going to check that real quick, Joshua 11:16, because you never can tell. Uh, they like to, 11:16. They like to translate the same word in different ways depending on how they feel at the moment. And I'm being kind by saying that because I don't think their feelings have anything to do with it. But I just want to be absolutely sure. And the Oribe, uh-huh. Chapelle. Mm. No, it's not a valley. For a valley, you would see Omek or Nahal. Um, and the reason you would see Nahal, and why typically I would usually say river, is because just about every valley has a river, unless it's in an extremely arid land, and then it just becomes a wadi. And the Oribe, or basically plain, uh, the air, the mountain, Yisrael, the air, Yisrael. This is a very different landscape than what I'm thinking of when they try to tell me that this area here, and I don't even care if you want to go into Sinai, I really don't, but I can tell you one thing. If they're trying to convince us that these mountains down here are 
what they call Sayer, it's Shoir, and that is Adum, um, then we're definitely locked. We are locked into only being able to work with certain locales. Um, and I'm certainly not seeing that fit too well yet. But <clears throat> we've got this land of Gashan where they build these cities, Pathom and Romsis. And the issue is going to be that as per like Numbers 33 that I had just read, go down here a little bit, Numbers 33, 3, and they departed from Romsis in the first month on the 15th day of the first month on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Yisrael went out with a high hand in the sight of all of the Mitzrim. And Numbers 33, 5, and the children, or Bani, the sons of Yisrael, removed from Romsis and pitched in Sukkoth. And this is this is going to very much help to dictate <clears throat> our uh, ad hoc map here when we pick up and read some descriptions on Sukkoth and try to figure out where Sukkoth would be and what kind of sense it might make to go to Sukkoth from Romsis and back to Yom Sup, which they tell us is the Red Sea. And that's where I'm going to pick up in part two. So, till next time, see ya.